welcome. This is the lecture three of Big History 2020 series. In this particular lecture, we are looking at one of the most understood、um, concept in modern times is the atomic theory. This is one of the、uh, key fundamental understanding of nature from physics and chemistry. The idea. Is better illustrated by using a counter example. When we look at matter, we can start think, thinking of how is, is the matter,、uh, what is the nature of the matter. We we want to know if we want if we are going to divide some material into halves and continue to do that. Can we do that indefinitely? Or at some point, we reach to the point that we have reached the smallest、uh, unit of the matter. So this is a contrast to different concept here. One is the con the concept of continuous matter. The 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 things that make up our world is can be divided. No matter how many times you want to do that, you can keep on doing that. That's continuous. But the atomic theory tells us that no, at certain points you reach the smallest unit of that matter, and there's no, ah,、uh, no way you can proceed onwards. Of course, ah,、uh, if we limit to chemistry, then we have atoms. But if we go into high energy particle physics, then we know that atoms itself can be divided into even smaller units. But anyway. The interesting about interesting thing about our understanding of the universe today is that almost everything has the smallest unit. So this atomic、uh, concept actually extends to even、um, smaller other、uh, domains. We we shall go to that,、uh, come to that、uh, in the future、uh, in the future lectures. Here I want to. Run over a few、uh, laws, and these laws enabled the chemists to start doing quantitative work. The first law is the conservation of mass. Basically, is saying that、uh, matter is conserved. You cannot create、uh, something from nothing. But unfortunately, in quantum mechanics, that is exactly what might happen. But anyway. For、uh, matters we are dealing with in a day-to-day -day basis, we know that we cannot create something out of nothing. This actually go back to、uh, ancient times.、Uh, the Greek philosophy had this、uh, "nothing comes from nothing" concept. So this is quite old, and this concept had eventually developed into、uh, the domain of chemistry and、um, the chemist. By the 18th century, understand that the、uh, reactants in the chemical reactions and the product from that reactions is always conserved. That means the weight, the the weight of the、uh, ingredients at the beginning, and the weight of the product at the end is always the same. This enabled、uh, chemists to start doing some quantitative work. So this is、um, defined in this、um, so-called law of conservation of mass, which states that total mass in a chemical reaction remains constant. That is, the reactants have the same mass as the products. The other concept which、uh, becomes useful is to look at the chemical properties and then、uh, trying to.、Um, Produce some rules about the chemical properties, and from there we started to、um, uh, able to arrange elements into different、uh, by weights into a series, and that co come to the、uh, understanding of so called the periodic table. Now, in order to reach that, then we first have to understand that when、uh, two reactants are combined to form a A compound, a product. The ratio is always fixed. You have one unit of X. You always combine with say M unit of 
uh, why to produce a something of a Z? Well, the mass is conserved, but the ratio of these two um, reactants is also always conserved in order to produce the same product. When the reactants can actually produce two different products, for example, uh, carbon with oxygen, then we can produce a carbon monoxide as well as a carbon dioxide. When that happens, then it is interesting to note that the same amount of carbon will react with some units of oxygen and to produce carbon monoxide and will react with another units of oxygen to produce carbon dioxide. When we measure the uh, ratio of the two oxygen, in this case, 100 grams of a carbon will react with 133 grams of oxygen to produce carbon monoxide. 100 grams of carbon will react with 266 grams of oxygen to produce carbon dioxide. You will take these two numbers, 133 and 266. They are in a small whole number ratio. Now, that introduced the idea of valency. Okay, carbon can have valence 1 or valence 2, etc., etc. But in fact, carbon has a valence of 4. But that is another thing we will talk about later on. But anyway, once we got this valency idea, then people started to arrange the elements in mass as well as its chemical properties. The first one who arranged that in according to mass is John Dalton. He is a chemist, physicist, and methodologist. He is well known in his theory about the periodic table, but he is basically the first one in 1803, uh, presented a paper where he assumed the unit weight of hydrogen to be one, and then computes the other elements. He is interested to find that most of these other elements are multiple, a whole number multiple of hydrogen. Um, from the diagram here, we see that he put hydrogen one, and then carbon, the number three, F5, now which is, we know that it should be six rather than five, and its weight is 12 rather than 13. But anyway, uh, his concepts, although there are some mistakes, but the concepts stick. So here he, he makes some mistakes about this and that, but that's not of our primary interest. We're going forward to another domain is in the, in the gas. When we have equal volumes of gas at the same temperature and pressure, then it will have the same number of molecules. This is known as Avogadro's law. Now, again, we started to understand that, well, when people, when things combine, when two different elements combine to form another element, the molecule or, or the basic unit, when it is in free state in a gas, then you will always occupy the same volume and, and pressure and temperature when they are the same. Now this law actually started to uh, help us to uh, we understand the the uh, valency a little bit better, and in order to prove that um, matters make up of atoms, we can also look at another uh, domain is in um, biology. Now, if we have some very small particles like pollen or dust floating in water, and you look at it under microscope. Then you'll find that these uh, small particles uh, tend to jiggle here and there. This is described first by uh, a British botanist, Robert Brown, in 1827. And therefore, this motion is known as the Brownian motion. Now, it was not until 1905 when Albert Einstein put in a theory to explain this Brownian movement. 
his uh, explanation is that okay, this uh, little uh, pollen suspended in water is being um, heat continuously by the water molecules. The water molecules um, therefore uh, heat the small particles and making it jerk in all different directions. Now this uh, model is later validated in 1908 by a French physicist. Okay, we now have several ideas all coming together. So let's put them together into a periodic table. Um, people have started to arrange all these known elements uh, into order. So the first thing they, they try to do is arrange them like into gas, into metals, into non-metals, all kinds of things. And then once you can start to measuring its weight, then as I said before, John Dalton arranged it in a in a series, in one after another, and using hydrogen as one. But when you do that, then some other interesting thing happens. Every now and then, the chemical properties seem to repeat. That is uh, the con concept of valency. The valency seems to repeat from one, two, three, four, and then uh, minus three, minus two, minus one, etc. So uh, if you arrange that in that order, you can put them into a table. Now, of course, this is the most common table. There are other forms like this one. Basically, uh, they are saying that along a certain line, for example, um, from the middle, from there, the first one is halogen, and you look at the, um, and which one? Uh, this next one is, I uh, can't see, it, sodium, helium, uh, lithium, okay. Lithium, after lithium is uh, sodium, potassium, etc., etc. They seem to fall into this um, neat way. So people started, okay, in that case, that then the matter is an atom and they have different chemical properties. These chemical properties uh, control the order. Then come the subatomic structure. For a long time, people think, okay, atoms must be the smallest possible division of matter. But that ends until 1897, when a physicist, J.J. Uh, Thomson, discovered that um, there are electrons. How do you do that? Okay, This is his apparatus. Uh, this is the schematic. So this is a uh, glass flask, and the gas inside the flask has been um, evacuated, so there is a vacuum inside. And he puts a negative cathode at one end, and then a positive uh, angle on the other end, which is on the left side of this uh, picture, indicated by negative and plus. In the angle, there is a small slit. So when, when the electrons being attracted from the negative end to the positive end, it will accelerate. And then some of them will pass through that lead and then will strike the uh, flask at the other end, causing a light, a fluorescent light. He found that this fluorescent light, this light, can be deflected by electric field. So in the middle, in the yellow section, we have the positive under it and negative above it. So the, it, it seems that the, the light bends. Now, of course, what we cannot see the blue light in, in the experiment. What we can see is the dot that is striped on the glass at the other end. But we can infer that this thing which strike on the other end must be negative. If that's negative, that means something else is coming out from the atom of the electrons. Okay. So now we know that the atoms must be made out of 
something, the matter itself, plus some electron around it, or maybe embedded in it. So Thomson suggested that atoms are actually divisible, and this divisible things consists of at least two things: something positive and something negative. The negative thing being the electrons, which he can accelerate out of the material and then hit on the other side and see it as a dot. Well, what is this、um, middle thing? The the positive thing. So there are two models here. One model is a is the Thomson's model. He is thinking of、uh, this positive thing is like a pudding, ah、uh, pudding, and the electrons are something that's sticking on this pudding. So all the positive thing will be probably in a circle, something like that. But when somebody try try to heat. A very thin gold foil, that is a、uh, Rutherford. He was surprised to find that some of these thing which hit the、um, uh, gold foil actually bounce right back, as shown in this diagram here, the Rutherford's model. That in the Thomson model, something trying to hit it, it will just pass through. Or it will be stopped either way. So you expect to see all these、uh, particles with hitting the material will be concentrated on one end. But to his surprise, we found that there is something we felt backwards. That means the atom itself must have a very heavy center, which is positive, with electrons around it outside. So for most of those heat material which is passing through, it just pass through, but some of them will bounce at this nucleus. So now we have the atom atomic model of a nucleus which is quite heavy, surrounded by、uh, electrons. Then come the quantum model of the Atoms. Now, if the electrons is in the outside and there's a positive nucleus, then if the electron is not moving around the the nucleus, it will just be attracted towards the nucleus, and therefore we we combine. So it won't be outside. So the electron must be somehow maintained outside of. In the outer surface of the atom, whereas there is a heavy nucleus at the center. Now, these electrons orbiting or, or or rotating around the nucleus can jump from one one orbit into another orbit. When it jumps orbit, when it's further away from the nucleus, it has more energy. When it's closer, it has less energy. The interesting thing is, these orbits are all、uh, very defined, well defined. You cannot have different orbits. And using this orbit model, it actually can explain the valency. So that is very interesting. By that time,、um, Max Frank had actually done quite a bit of work, and he suggested that light is actually A quantum, that means it's a unit. Again, similar to、um, at,、uh, matter, similar to matter. Matter is a con is atomic, and light is also like that. Light energy is of a special unit, and that energy depends on its frequency. The higher the frequency, the、um, that quanta will represent. Uh, a more、uh, violet color. The lower frequency represent the red color. And at that time, when people、uh, use heat to heat up some different metals, they discover the metals are different color. So to explain that,、uh, Bohr 
come up with this idea that, that these electrons will orbit in certain uh, orbits. And when it jump from one orbital to another orbital, then it will either attract or emit energy in the form of light. He is able to apply this model to hydrogen and can predict some of the hydrogen spectrum. The hydrogen spectrum means if we heat up hydrogen, then hydrogen will emit a certain characteristic light. You will put this light through some prism, for example, and spread out the light into its different color. We find that there are very some very bright, bright lines with a lot of dark areas. That means the light coming out from the heating up of hydrogen comes in a special uh, in lines rather than continuously from uh, red to orange and some forth, something like that. So that's called the atomic spectrum. Atomic spectrum becomes one of the very important tools big history will use or cosmology will use to study our universe. So going back to big history, why we talk all the, take all this trouble to understand atomic theory? Well, to understand the universe, what we can do is by looking at it. Because all the stars, all the galaxies, everything else is too far away from us. We have no way to collect anything from them in order to understand them. The only thing we have from these objects are the lights that is coming from these objects. So if we can understand how light is emitted, how light will pass through different material causing different uh, effects, then we will be able to understand a lot more. So that's why uh, this lecture is on atomic uh, theory. But basically to sum up is that we understand that our universe is made up of discrete units. In the chemical um, domain, the smallest unit is called an atom. But if we go inside the atom, we find that the atom will consist of a nucleus, which is a very heavy uh, positive um, nucleus, which uh, takes most of the weight of the atom, with electrons moving around the nucleus. When the electrons move from one distance to another distance around the nucleus, they will absorb or emit light. And this light coming out from it is characteristic of the atom. And they are in a spectrum which we will be able to match with the spectrum we get from our experiments here. So when we look at some light coming from a galaxy or from a star, then we will be able to see whether there are specific spectral lines. And from that spectral lines, we can compare it and find out what kind of elements are there. So this is essentially why we will talk about atomic theory in order to understand this. So in the next lecture, we will go into uh, a bit more about how we observe the universe. Thank you for uh, listening. Um, the next lecture will be up as soon as I can prepare it. Thank you. Bye-bye.